Good evening, polar bears and friends. Can I hear a go, you bears? You can whisper. It doesn't feel right to whisper. It doesn't feel right to whisper. Good evening. My name is Stacy Jones Lee, and I am delighted to be here with you. I am a diehard polar bear, graduate of the class of 2000, a three sport athlete myself, and I'm so happy to be here. What I did leave off of that is that I actually also served on the Hall of Honor Selection Committee, which is why I'm here tonight. For some, today's trip to campus is a homecoming, while for others, you're visiting for the first time. No matter how you came to be here, thank you for joining us. Now in its 14th induction cycle, the Athletic Hall of Honor was created to recognize Bowdoin's finest athletes. The Hall's purpose is to celebrate and perpetuate the memory of those who have brought distinction, honor, and excellence to Bowdoin through their achievements in athletics. The Hall of Honor Selection Committee spent many hours discussing hundreds of nominees, including athletes, administrators, and teams. And in our last cycle, most of those conversations for myself were spent on the floor in an upstairs den with a baby of about three months at the height of the pandemic as he was born on March 18th. And so I don't think my committee members ever saw my face in the last cycle. So it's good to see you. With such a large number of Bowdoin's most accomplished athletes to choose from, the selection process was not easy and has not been easy in any of the years that I've served. Selecting only six inductees from this very impressive group involves careful consideration of an enormous amount of material. The nominee pool is deep and rich and gets stronger every year as more classes become eligible. We selected an extraordinary class of inductees who represent some of the best of Bowdoin athletics. I am proud of the selection committee and the process they went through and hope today's inductees understand what an impressive group they are entering today. I'd like to recognize my fellow committee members and thank them for their time and attention to this important work. Duke Albanese from the class of 1971, Cliff Webster from the class of 1972, Matt Karras from the class of 1978, Susan Pardue from the class of 1986, and Chris Roy from the class of 1992. Fellow, com fellow committee members, it has been an honor to serve with you. <laughs> Over time, the venues may have changed. We no longer run laps in the hide cage, shoot hoops in Sergeant Jim, or skate at Dayton Arena. But with over 650 student athletes, it is clear that athletics continues to energize this campus, develop and refine talent, and fuel the spirit of those who study, work, and coach here at Bowdoin. Bowdoin Athletics teaches commitment, teamwork, preparation, and sportsmanship. Today's honorees embodied all of these important values while in competition and also in their lives after Bowdoin. If you haven't already been through the lobby of the Buck Fitness Center, make it a priority tomorrow to check out the interactive digital display highlighting photos, stories, and statistics of each inductee. This display conveys Bowdoin's rich and storied history to a new generation of student athletes. A list of past Athletic Hall of Honor inductees is provided in the back of your program. However, I'd like to pause a moment and recognize those members that are with us today to help celebrate the Hall's newest inductees. Will past Hall Honor inductees please stand and be recognized? Thank you all so much for being here. Finally, we would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to the index tees, their families and friends who have waited two long years for this induction ceremony. We hope that the memories of this evening's event and this weekend are worth the wait. Now, I am delighted to introduce Bowdoin's 15th president, Clayton Rose. Clayton.
Thank you, Stacy. That was great. Hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. So uh, as a college president, the temptation when I'm asked to do something like this is to decide whether I want to go for the one hour or the 90 minute version of my remarks. But I will uh, assuage your concerns and we'll keep this uh, brief. Um, the first thing I want to do is to congratulate uh, Leon's and Ray's families, as well as Kendall, Steph, uh, Nick, and Lindsay for uh, the remarkable accomplishments here at the college and for uh, the uh, recognition, incredibly well-deserved recognition that will come tonight. Uh, each of you represents the very best of Bowdoin, uh, and you are exemplars for uh, what we value here at the college and for our sense of community. I wanted to share a couple of specific thoughts this evening um, before I exit the stage and join the audience. The first is to share with you uh, something that I've said to uh, members of our athletic teams last year, when, particularly in the fall when we were getting back and they were, uh, we were starting to get back to normal and play, and I, I made an effort to get out and visit with each team. And then again this year in a more informal way, uh, both with teams and with players, including last weekend when I ran into several of the guys on the men's soccer team. And that is that, you know, I, I recognize, I think all of us recognize that those of you who are athletes here at Bowdoin uh, engage in your sport or sports because it's who you are. You do it to be excellent. Uh, you do it for the others on your team. And you do it to win uh, and to prevail. And that is all fantastic. But don't ever forget how important athletics is and what our athletes are doing to the rest of the college. It matters greatly here. And we've, we've witnessed that now more than ever with the absence of athletics and the absence of uh, so much of what's gone on at Bowdoin over the last couple of years. But, uh, but everyone in our community uh, takes enormous pride in what our athletes accomplish, what our teams accomplish, and in the, um, the, the joy, the hard work, the heartbreak that comes with being a, a great D3 athlete. Um, and so I, I really want to just uh, say that tonight as well, that it's not just about the athletic community at Bowdoin, it's about the entire community at Bowdoin. And we are so grateful and so proud uh, for everything that goes on uh, in our athletic department. And that brings me to the second thing that I wanted to say, that the, um, the, the challenges that we've all faced as a, as a college community, all of you and the, your lives and families, uh, uh, everyone in the nation and beyond over the last couple of years has been, uh, been tremendous, historic in so many ways. Uh, and there have been so many folks uh, here at the college that have rallied together and supported one another and gone above and beyond and helping to uh, pull us through in what I think has been uh, a really great way, not without our challenges at moments, but, um, but the way this college has prevailed during a historically difficult time is something to behold. But a group that's really been incredible and at the center of so much of our efforts were our athletic trainers. Now, those who are athletes know that every day those, these folks who are our trainers are, uh, are there for you and play a critical role in the success of our athletes and of our teams. But, um, but our trainers uh, helped to um, pull us through COVID in a really remarkable way. And I'd just like to give them a shout out and a round of applause tonight. So. I also want to make note of the uh, critical importance that our athletes, our coaches, our, our staff, uh, our teams play in the essential work of diversity, equity, and inclusion here at the college. Uh, this is an effort that's been going on long before I arrived. We've taken it into its next chapter in the last few years and moved it to an entirely new level. Um, the Athletes of Color Coalition here at Bowdoin uh, several years ago really uh, um, uh, created a wake-up call for many of us about the work that we need to do better here. Uh, and I'm incredibly grateful to them for that wake-up call. And then I'm incredibly grateful to our, uh, our athletes, to our coaches, and to the staff here, and to Tim as well, uh, for um, really paying attention and listening and internalizing that and doing the work. And our athletic teams have in many ways been on the forefront of the effort here to become a more inclusive community, one where equity is really what we're all about. This is a journey for us, um, but, uh, but um, 
uh, paid deep attention to what, um, what was being said. More work to do for sure across the entire college. Um, but in many ways, uh, our athletes uh, and our teams are helping us to lead the way here. Uh, and for that, I am grateful as well. Um, and finally, I want to thank uh, our, our coaches and staffs for all that you do um, uh, to, uh, um, to make it possible for our athletes to perform in the way that they do uh, and for allowing them to be student athletes, uh, to engage and excel at their athletics, to engage in, in their studies, to engage and excel uh, at their athletics, uh, and also um, to have lives that are outside of both of those and to, uh, to engage in those activities and in, uh, uh, in those moments that are important to them as human beings away from, uh, from both their studies and athletics. Um, I think tonight we're reminded that uh, the dedication, the leadership, the role modeling that comes from our athletes, that comes from our coaches, and that comes from our staff are essential qualities of what makes Bowdoin such a remarkable college. I'm incredibly grateful to be here tonight, to be with our, uh, our honorees, uh, and to enjoy the moment. So thank you all, and congratulations to those that are being honored. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, it's uh, really wonderful to have uh, you and Julianne with us tonight, and um, in our athletic department, I know we're incredibly grateful for all of the support that you've provided to our athletes and coaches uh, during your tenure here as president at, at Bowdoin. And um, for those of you who aren't aware, that extends um, well beyond just being a spectator uh, along the sidelines at games on campus, um, but Clayton has traveled to support our teams across the country um, in NCAA tournament games. And even is known to play an occasional uh, game of horse in Moral Gym with our basketball players. So um, for all of that support, thank you very much. Um, you've certainly um, made an impact uh, within our department that will last long after your time at Bowdoin concludes. So thank you. <clears throat> it really is a, a pleasure to be here tonight uh, with the family, friends, coaches, teammates and classmates um, of our 2020 um, Athletic Hall of Honor inductees. Um, and I have in my notes here, finally, with a dash, um, because it's been a little while since uh, this class was selected. And um, I hope that for all of you, um, it's worth the wait. And, uh, and this is a great experience, because we're really happy to have everyone here with us this evening to celebrate your tremendous achievements um, at the college and welcome um, our 14th uh, Athletic Hall of Honor class at Bowdoin. Uh, as Stacy mentioned, the Athletic Hall of Honor recognizes student athletes and coaches that have brought honor and excellence to the college through their athletic accomplishments. And as we'll see here this evening, uh, the class of 2020 certainly has met that very high standard. Athletics at Bowdoin is a valuable complement to the educational mission of the college. The lessons learned in the athletic arena provide an opportunity for our students to gain experience with success failure, and working through adversity. In, a, in addition to nurturing relationships with people with a wide range of lived experiences and possessing worldviews different than their own, while also aiding in the development of critical leadership and communication skills that will serve them well long after their time at Bowdoin is over. Our ceremony tonight provides an opportunity to celebrate members of our community that have excelled athletically within the context of the small college liberal arts educational environment we all believe in so deeply. We are also reminded of the passionate connection to the college that participation in athletics fosters as each of our inductees today continue to call Bowdoin home and being a polar bear holds a very special place in their heart. As we begin our ceremony tonight, I'd like to thank our selection committee for their commitment to the college, to our athletic department and our hall of honor. We're fortunate to have uh, many worthy candidates, as Stacy mentioned. Um, and while our inductees were inducted uh, over two years ago, were selected over two years ago, um, our gratitude for the work by our committee um, has not wavered. I'd also like to convey a special uh, note of thanks to Stacy for traveling uh, to be here with us tonight to play an important role in our ceremony. 
as well as Dave Peck, um, who traveled quite a distance uh, as well to be here with us. We're very grateful to have you um, uh, as part of our ceremony, and I'm also thankful to our inductee presenters as well. Finally, our event this evening would not have been possible without the uh, incredible and tireless work of um, Senior Associate Director of Alumni Relations, Lindsay Lassard. Lindsay, can you please stand for a moment? <laughs> Lindsay's not going into the Hall of Honor uh, tonight, but she's on the short list. Um, this truly would not have come together um, without um, her thoughtfulness, uh, the extent to which she cares about this event and athletics at Bowdoin, um, and a healthy dose of patience as well. So thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, congratulations um, to Kendall, Lindsay, Steph, Nick, uh, and the Buck and LaBelle families um, on your induction into our Hall of Honor. Um, your contributions to Bowdoin Athletics and our campus community have made us all proud and really set a very high standard for our current and future student athletes to aspire to. At this time, I'd like to uh, welcome the aforementioned David Peck uh, to the stage. Uh, Dave is a member of the class of 2018, uh, and he was also a member of our uh, football and baseball programs while at Bowdoin. David Peck. <laughs> David will be guiding us through conversations with our inductees this evening. Um, and to begin our ceremony, um, it's my pleasure um, to welcome a critical member of our athletic department administrative staff. Um, many of you um, may have uh, recognized him in the um, reception as the guy who was probably working a scoring table while you were here as a student participating on our teams. Um, many of you may have worked for him um, while you were a student at Bowdoin as well. Um, our um, assistant athletic director for communications and sports information director, Jim Caton to welcome our first inductee. Good, uh, good evening. Um, as Tim mentioned, I'm Jim Caton, the Assistant Athletic Director for Communications here at Bowdoin. And tonight I'm filling in for uh, Chris Roy in the game program. Chris couldn't make it to uh, this evening's event. But I have the privilege of introducing our first inductee of the evening. Kendall Cox LeClaire. So, Kendall, you get to sit there while I embarrass you for a moment. Um, Kendall, the class of 2005, you're the epitome of a Bowdoin student athlete on the lacrosse field, the soccer field, and in the classroom. Your prowess in two sports, your leadership, and your work ethic garnered you the extraordinary distinction of being named a Division III First Team All-American in two different sports twice. You're an outstanding defender for some of Coach John Cullen's finest women's soccer teams, leading a defensive unit that helped the program to a combined 36 wins against just 15 losses. You were chosen for the Division III All-American first team twice and were named All-New England and All-NESCAC three times in your career. As a goalie for the lacrosse team, you were equally if not more accomplished, leading the team to a combined four-year record of 45 wins and 22 losses. You set individual Bowdoin women's lacrosse records for single season wins and minutes, and you remain in the top 10 all time in career saves, goals against, wins, and minutes played. Personally, I recall joking with head coach Liz Grote during your senior year that with over 3,000 minutes played, you had spent the equivalent of two full days of your life in goal for the Polar Bears. <laughs> in addition to twice being named Division III First Team All-American in lacrosse, you were twice named to the All-New England and All-NESCAC First Teams, and in your senior year in 2005 as a captain, you were honored as Division III Goaltender of the Year. Off the field, you're a Saren James Bowden scholar, <laughs> majoring in psychology and minoring in education, and we're a Division III academic All-American. Your record of excellence as a student while achieving success at the highest levels in two sports places you among the most distinguished student athletes to grace the playing fields and classrooms at Bowden. Kendall, congratulations. We are proud to celebrate your induction into the Bowden College Athletic Hall of Honor. Yeah, so you can take this microphone there. It's all warmed up for you. 
Now, I spoke with Kendall before, and I said only hard-hitting questions, and I think she got another glass of wine. So yeah, here we are. I really, I really <laughs> thought Steph Pemper was going to go first. Oh, no. We, she, oh, she will be there. She, she will be there. She a great lead-off. You were chosen. She will go. She will go last. We will save her. But I do want to ask, you know, right off the bat, the hardest question there is, why Bowdoin? Obviously, two sports, that was kind of what had your interest, but what about Brunswick and the campus itself was interesting to you as somebody from Connecticut? So I think I probably should say it was sort of a relentless, never going to quit until you commit recruiting style of Coach John Cullen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that wasn't really, he was more of a coach of life than sort of, uh, in terms of recruiting, but I think what I fell in love with the camp, I fell in love with the campus, I fell in love with the, with the people and the community. I mean, there's nothing, Bowdoin is just so special. Um, and I think you can, it's palpable. Uh, you drive, even not being here for six years, you drive back and immediately it just feels like home. That's what I was gonna ask, you know, you haven't been here in, in a little while, and somebody once told me, coming back, it's like you came back from a bad internship, and all of a sudden you're, you're just on campus and everything, you know, buildings change and the people change, but the feeling is still there. Did you feel that when you arrived this weekend, now with your family? Yes, and there's so many more, it's different, you know, there's the, and all of the, the beautiful changes are so wonderful and intentional, but it still feels that like it has the same soul and foundation that it always had. Let's talk about your athletic career. I knew, I knew that would get sort of a reaction. Brace yourself. All-American, not one sport, but multiple sports. Um, what was it like kind of balancing that, not only having two sports, but excelling in both to the point? What were kind of the challenges and some of the benefits that came with kind of balancing that at, at obviously a, a, an academic institution like this? I think I... Thank goodness I had two sports because I think um, I got into the most trouble during the winter. Um, <laughs> so I'm really grateful that I had the fall and the spring. Um, and then I just cheered for the women's basketball team in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> well represented tonight, too. I mean, you know what? Aren't they always upstaging the fall and winter? I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's just... I'm sick of it 20 years later. <laughs> Um, I mean, but you mentioned it. That's something I was going to ask. Yeah. Cause, cause yeah, the basketball team. Let's go. The basketball team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Coach Pepper, we'll talk to you Sorry. later, later. But no, I mean, that's a good point. And I think a lot of athletes can kind of relate to that. Sometimes you do your best work in the classroom yeah. when you're in season because you're locked in, you're regimented, you have a routine, you have practice. Obviously, as a Sarah James Bowden scholar, that was the case for you. But what was the experience like working with two different coaches yeah. and two legendary coaches at that? Uh, in terms of the two coaches that I think I was so lucky to have, I honestly sort of mainstays and, and legends, both of them, um, in soccer and lacrosse. I think Coach Cullen, I was lucky to have him sort of towards the end of his career um, at Bowdoin, and he had all of this wisdom. Um, and I ended up in the moment thinking like, oh, I have... Now I have Liz Grote, it's sort of um, this, a totally, you know, at the beginning of her career, and at the time, I thought that they were very different. But I think in terms of looking back, they had a very similar style in that they both brought, they loved the sports that they coached, they had so much joy doing it, and they also just always loved their players. Um, so, yeah, they're actually, even though they were different, you know, Coach Cullen never really got out there, and Liz Grote at the time still had probably the best shot on the team. <laughs> um, we were so scared of her. Um, <laughs> but, but, but they were quite similar. She got you ready. She did, yeah. She got you ready, totally. that's key. So, I mean, looking back now, it's been a couple of years. Yeah. What do you, as it's kind of s s sunk in a little bit, and now you're sitting here, what do you take away from your time? What do you remember? Obviously the people, the coaches, yeah. but is there something about your time here and, and just the dominance that you had on the athletic field and in the classroom that you take away and maybe, you know, uh, something you want your kids to hear even if they're, you know, not in coloring books or whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. My, um, ah, there's so many memories. I think I was driving up here and thinking about uh, one of my good friends and teammates uh, and roommates came, Bridget, um, and I, was, I thought of this memory. We were walking, it must have been 
in February and we're walking to the lacrosse field and we were just, you know, it was like cold and we were just like, ugh. Um, I can't even remember what class we had or we had, it was a stressful week. And she had just gotten off the phone with her dad, another Levin, legend, Kevin Burke. Um, and he had said to her, Bridget, what do you have to, what are you guys complaining about? Like I would, you get to play sports every day and you get to read these incredible books and learn, like this is so, you're so lucky. And at the time we're like, ugh, whatever. Um, <laughs> and looking back, he was so right. I think, you know, it just, it was just such a magical time. And then there's, it's this, you know, and that, that's true of any college experience, but I think Bowdoin really lets you do that um, and, and really has the right values and, and support system to, to give you those opportunities. What was your reaction when you found out that you were being inducted into the hall? Totally shocked because I'm, I was a defender. I think I, like in soccer, I think I scored like one, I have no stats. Yeah, what are the stats? Nothing. It's like in lacrosse, yeah. defender, it's brown balls totally. picked up. I mean, you get saves for a goalie, right. but no, in for soccer. For, yeah, no, so like completely shocked. Like, I'm t honored, but. Um, we go both quantitative no, and qualitative. But there's so many people that were so, I mean, it was way better, so. Um, <laughs> And I just, I just loved being part of the team, and every team, and every, and the community, and I just felt so grateful. So I'm, I'm completely humbled and honored to, to have this opportunity. But yeah, I don't, I'm not in a lot of record books. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're here right now. <laughs> totally. That's, 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 that's what it takes, and that's, yeah. that's the penultimate, or yes. the ultimate, I just, I just say. So congratulations. Thank you for coming up here. I hope that wasn't no, too bad. No, this was great. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah, you so much. Of course. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank congratulations. You. Thank, Thank you. you. I think that's right. Good evening. And uh, start off with congratulations, Kendall. Uh, boy, that's an honor, well deserved. Terrific, just so proud of you. I am Duke Albanese, class of 1971, proud parent of two Bowdoin alums who competed for the college. Way back in the day, I was privileged to play football, baseball, and rugby. And I'll just say this, I was telling someone earlier at the reception that uh, when rugby started at Bowdoin, uh, you'll never guess who our coach was. His name was Roger Howell, and he was the president of the college. Um, can't beat that one. Um, as a member of the, of the Hall of Honor Selection Committee, it is my honor to welcome Leonardo Buck into the Bowdoin Athletic Hall of Honor. A member of the class of 1938, Leonardo Buck made his mark at Bowdoin in the state of Maine and at the national level as a top amateur golfer and one of the most respected and influential rules officials in the sport. A multi-sport athlete of remarkable talent who played six varsity sports at nearby Morse High School in Bath, Leon captained Bowdoin's state championship hockey team and was inducted into the baseball, Maine Baseball Hall of Fame. But Leon's greatest passion was golf. For 25 years, Leon stood as one of Maine's leading amateur golfers, and he is one of only four Bowdoin graduates who have won the state's amateur golf championship. In addition to winning the Maine State Amateur Championship in 1950, Leon was the state senior champion on five occasions, the Bath Country Club champion 12 times, state parent and child champions with his son Robert, and a 15-time representative of Maine in the North and South Championship at Pinehurst, North Carolina. A distinguished dentist, Leon also won the Maine and New England Dental Championships many times and was the national dental champion in Miami in 1969. Leon was equally decorated as a rules official for the United States Golf Association. Among the USGA's most revered and influential officials for nearly 50 years, Leon officiated at 36 national golf championships as well as numerous New England professional and amateur events. Inducted into both the Maine Sports Hall of Fame in 1988, and the Maine Golf Hall of Fame in 1996, Leon received the USGA's inaugural Ike Granger Centennial Award in 1995 for his service to the organization and to the sport. In recognition 
of Leon's extraordinary impact on the sport of golf at Bowdoin in Maine and throughout the country, we join his family today to celebrate his well-deserved induction into the Bowdoin College Hall of Honor. Here to accept the award on behalf of the Buck family is Leon's grandson, Jonathan Buck. Now John brought props, which always makes things interesting. What, did we just describe what yeah. this book is real quick? So there's this, some... this is a golfer's log. Uh, if you knew Leonardo, uh, he kept track of everything. And I, I found this today, uh, and in it, uh, it is a, a, a golf outing in Pinehurst, and it says, Ray, flea bite. We don't know what that means yet. We'll figure it out. LaBelle. And it's just amazing, uh, the friendship, uh, and, and actually humbled by... Attorney Day's recommendation letter, and just reading the accolades of both your father and my grandfather, um, it's amazing. Pretty, pretty big shoes to fill. What do you think your, your grandfather would think or say uh, about this, being inducted into the Hall of Honor at a place that was obviously special to him, special to your family, but what do you think he would say or tell you if he was telling you about it? Well, first off, I'm, I, I wish this happened sooner uh, and when he was alive to, to experience it because I, I know how hard he worked, um, what an inspiration he was for so many people. It was amazing to see how many people would just visit him, uh, mm -hmm. but he would be humbled ab about it. I don't think he would be, uh, you know, he wouldn't be braggart uh, in any, any respect, mm -hmm. and he'd be grateful for the presence of the folks that he's in and the accolades um, and, and the great, really great folks that have come out of Bowdoin. Uh, I know this is... Uh, I've sat in the Bowdoin chair looking at the Kennebec River uh, in, in, at his house many times, uh, and it's probably one of my favorite chairs to sit in. What kind of impact did he have on you and your family, just whether it was you guys golfing or um, at home, or did you ever read his logs and try and get some notes to shave <laughs> off five strokes? You know, what, what kind of influence did he have? Uh, there, there was a... I, I, I received a golf club, I think, uh, out of the womb. <laughs> it's kind of, and uh, I, I got a letter uh, last night from uh, my uncle. Um, his, his one of his sons, and, and he's in Florida. He couldn't make it today because of the the storm down there. And it, it just it, it kind of reminded me of my childhood, in, in and around my grandfather as well, where uh, you know it, it was Sunday dinners, um, experience, you know, a lot of family. A, a lot of joking around. I mean, I remember the basement. We, we moved to, to Maine, and I remember uh, the basement that my uncle talked about where he made it into kind of a, a, a hangout for the kids. There was a shooting range. There was a boxing. There was a weight room. There was, you know, a, he always had uh, a golf net downstairs, and I'd go downstairs and hit ball, golf balls in the basement into a net, you know, as, as long ago as I can remember. Uh, probably one of my fondest memories, and, and my cousins are here, and my sister, and, and we used to go to this place, Sabino. This area is, is absolutely amazing. He grew up, you know, our family's from the, uh, this area from the 1600s, but, you know, growing up on the water, and there was a place in Sabino where he had this mirror uh, and, a, and a little window, and you had to get your golf swing just right. Your head couldn't move, and you'd be looking in the mirror, looking in the golf swing, and hitting the balls into the water across the cove, and buckets full. Like, we had buckets and buckets full. And I, I can't, the, the people that would come to visit him just to hit golf balls in the cove, it was amazing. And then he'd go out there in his boat and pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> Scoop them up. And I remember doing it with him a whole bunch of times. It was, it was amazing. So, I, I mean, he, he, very influential in, in my life, uh, and, and obviously all my, my cousins, my sister, and... and you know, a, a lot of people touched a lot of people, and and this this book was kind of special to find today. It just, I mean, it popped out at me. Are there any and, passages here? Any tips? Well, it we says can... that uh, he and Ray, uh, so Dr. LaBelle picked him up. They spent some holiday somewhere. Something about a duck hook. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he chunked it. Ah, yeah, chunked man. it. Right. Um, so did you ever go out golfing? I'm sure golfing with him. He was. Uh, a rule enforcer. That was his job. He was a legend. Yeah. You hit it into the rough. Could you? Yeah, you would not. Did you move get it caught. at all? Or? 
No. What happened if you did? Oh, you would, you would definitely hear about it. Demerit. Yeah, demerits, uh, you know, it, it, as a young age to me, it was, it was always about the rules. If you went over to his house, he'd want to talk to you about a rule, a rule that he came up with. Um, and the first thing you would walk in, I mean, my wife didn't play golf, and he hands her a basketball and show her, you know, how to make the golf swing. Uh, you know, it's always about golf, but, you know, also the baseball, the hockey. Um, and he, he just always said, just do your best, be the best. What kind of, um, or how would you describe his, you know, you kind of went into his impact, but his legacy and how important this area was, being from Bath and obviously going to Bowdoin. What kind of impact did he have, not only on your family, but on everybody within, you know, whatever you want, 30 mile, 50 mile right. radius? Uh, he he loves this area, radius. and, and, and I, I know our family love the area. There's hunting, uh, duck hunting. There's a couple uh, hunting camps in our family. Uh, the, the golf courses, the friendships. I mean, he, he was in the military for a while, went to Harvard Dental School, you know, moved back up here, had his practice in Bath for forever. Uh, I think he retired in 1980. And, you know, just the, the, the guests, probably one of the most, the, the neatest things that I remember as a kid is the people that would come to visit him um, and coming over to his house. Always, I mean, it, it, the camp, it didn't matter where we were, there were always people wanting to come visit with him and he always had a story and he could remember everything and the details. I don't know if he would go back and review his details. Of, this is from 1959, so those are the notes from, from <laughs> Where did one you year. find it? Where did, in a drawer? Uh, yeah. So, All right, there we yeah. go. Well, congratulations and thank you for sharing those stories. Appreciate it and, um, you know. Yeah, he, he would be excited and we're grateful as a family to thank you for having us here. Um, he's, he's touched a lot of people and he would be grateful for this award, so right, thank well, you so much. Thank you, appreciate it, appreciate the time, thank you. Not as young as I used to be. <laughs> They didn't work too well either when I was at Bowdoin a long, long time ago. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Sue Pardis, and I'm a member of the class of 1986. And like Stacy and Duke, I too was a three-sport athlete. I did, uh, I did dive four years with coach, under Coach uh, Charlie Butt with the swim team. And I had an awesome fall semester, sophomore year, playing JV soccer for Coach Cullen over there. Uh, and as a freshman, I played rugby. I uh, learned how to play rugby here at Bowdoin College. So clearly my experience as a three-sport athlete was very different, but it still was a lot of fun. As a member of the selection committee tonight, I do have the distinct privilege of welcoming Lindsay McNamara into the Bowdoin Athletic Hall of Honor. <laughs> Lindsay McNamara, of the class of 2009, you were quite simply one of the most decorated athletes in the history of Division III athletics and helped lead Bowdoin's field hockey program to previously unimagined heights. Your prolific scoring, which led the team in all four of your collegiate seasons, propelled Bowdoin to multiple league and national championships. Your ability to find the net was dependable and legendary. Your five goals and 10 points in a single game still stands as records in Bowdoin program history. And your completion of your remarkable four-year career, you were in sole possession of every scoring record in Bowdoin's history books, including career goals and points. Your extraordinary individual accolades include two-time Division III Field Hockey Player of the Year, two-time NESCAC Player of the Year, three-time All-American, including twice as a member of the first team, three-time first team All-New England, 
and three-time first-team All-NESCAC. Bowdoin's field hockey program was elevated from the moment you stepped on the field in your very first year. In that rookie season, in each of the three that followed, your, you led the team to the NESCAC championship. In 2007, your three goals in the national championship game carried the program to its first Division III title in any sport. And then in 2008, you sealed back-to-back -back national championships with a title-winning double overtime goal in the final game of your hockey career. Congratulations. I have to tell you, when I read that the first time, I'm a parent of former student athletes, one that played at a very high level. I couldn't imagine what it would have been like to have been one of your parents. <laughs> Watching that first game and then coming back a year later to watch that second game. I can honestly say when I read it, I did have shivers up my spine and I almost started to cry. And tonight when I was trying to find Moral Lounge, does any, I don't remember Moral Lounge. <laughs> There's a Moral Gym, but a Moral Lounge. I ran into this other individual, older, like myself, trying to find Moral Lounge and it was your dad. <laughs> and I will say, I think we both almost started to cry because I just couldn't imagine how he felt, and he shared a little bit of that with me this evening. Um, but in any case, in, in total, over the course of your Bowdoin career, the Polar Bears won an outstanding 74 games against a mere five losses as a team. Now, your athletic prowess was not limited to the realm of field hockey, as you also attained varsity letters in ice hockey and lacrosse during your time at Bowdoin. That included three seasons for the women's ice hockey team, where you scored 46 points in 66 games and finished third on the squad in scoring as a defenseman your senior year. <laughs> That's pretty impressive, and it's uh, uh, Lindsay. You help your teams reach an elite level of success, twice to the national pinnacle of competition, where the program has remained a Division Three power in the years that followed. We are proud to recognize your uniquely impactful legacy in the Bowdoin field hockey program and pleased to celebrate your induction into the Bowdoin College Athletic Hall of Honor. Wow. Ah, jeez. <clears throat> When you hear all that, has, has that ever been laid out to you like that before, ever? No, it's super awkward. <laughs> I mean, when you hear that, I'm sure hundreds of memories on and off the field just flood in, you know, whether it was hockey or field hockey or what have you. But what do you think? Looking back now, you know, 10 plus years later, what do you think when you hear that? You have to throw in the 10 plus years. Um, no, I, I mean, Field hockey, ice hockey, lacrosse at Bowdoin, it was an incredible experience to be able to play all three of those sports. Um, super lucky and mostly coming out of it, all my teammates and, and friendships um, are the most important things that come out of that and amazing successes, of course, but um, it's all the, the women up there who are supporting me and our teammates um, all throughout that kind of 
stay with me, obviously. Now, were you similar to Kendall in that when you were in season, you stayed out of trouble more? Or how, was, how did that work? You, I mean, you didn't really have a choice. It kind of uh, worked out in your favor. I'm going to plead the fifth on that. <laughs> Good. That's the right <laughs> I told you, hard-hitting yeah. questions only. Yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, the field hockey team in particular, four straight Final Four appearances, two national championships. It's one thing to reach it. It's a whole other thing to win it. And it's something that I can't even imagine to repeat. What about that team and your teammates and your coaches was able to kind of sustain that through your four-year period? Yeah, I mean, I think that we had incredible leaders across the board that came in, and I had no idea that I was even going to play field hockey at Bowdoin. Um, to be honest, I was recruited to play ice hockey, so um, I was showed up with a, a couple pair of soccer um, shin guards on the first day and was there you go. just hopeless, glad <laughs> lad to be out there on the field. Um, so I had no idea what I was getting myself into, and we had incredible leaders on the field hockey team um, from our uh, senior class and our junior class. and. Um, we were just a family kind of from the beginning and obviously had some tragedies um, li losing Taryn King. Um, I think she was an incredible person and kind of brought everything together for us. And um, remember we had some goal setting at the beginning of the year in fr my freshman year and her goal was to win the national championship. And we all were saying, you know, I wanted to beat Middlebury and she had completely different standards um, and that's what we tried to live up to. Yeah, I did want to ask about that because obviously a lot of success, but tragedy and, and adversity with Taryn, how, how was the team able to, you know, refocus and, and kind of go forward after something like that? Yeah, I mean, it was incredibly difficult, but it really was kind of, um, became a family. Um, and obviously under the leadership of, of Nikki bringing us all together, um, it was the most difficult thing that happened in all of our lives. And um, but also brought great success because we were just trying to achieve the successes that, that she wanted for our team and what she set out to do. And I think that that's kind of was the foundation for the successes of, of Bowdoin Field Hockey. When you go forward into that junior season, when did you kind of, you know, have a feeling we have something, you know, obviously you had made two prior appearances, mm -hmm. but was there a thought that you could get over the hump here? I think when Nikki said it was a business trip um, was kind of the time where, <laughs> time where we knew we really needed to get it together. Um, no, I mean, like, that team was incredible. I think we had kind of maybe five or six goals scored on us the entire season. So we had a target on our back, and um, it was an incredible team, and, and I was lucky to be a part of it. And, you know, th this is an amazing accolade, but at the end of the day, it's a team sport, and I wouldn't be here um, without an, all of my teammates from all of those years across the board, across all my sports, so. How were the trips different? Obviously, year one is different from two, and then three, it becomes a business trip or whatnot, yeah. but how, yeah. you know, uh, how? We, we, were, we were under some pressure. We definitely needed to get it done by our, our junior year, um, but we were ready. I, I think that we had the preparation. We, we knew what we needed to do, and um, we definitely, we got it done, obviously, so it was an incredible season. And then your senior year, double overtime, mm -hmm. final game of the year. I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> I was tired. How did you do, I mean, how, I don't know. What, what do you yeah. remember? What do you remember about Being that? Being really game? tired. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not, not as tired as I am now after having a 10-week old. I don't know if he's still up there. He's not screaming right now, but um, no, I, it, it was just, you know, we were just going to gut it out. We were playing against um, Middlebury and our arch rival, and we went 10-0 against them, and that was the best way to finish my career. What was it like coming back? What was that trip like, um, and just the, the welcome from... I mean, you don't have to go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, maybe I please. But just, you know, coming back uh, as, as conquering yeah. heroes. Yeah, no, I mean, it was amazing. Uh, the community was out there. There were so many people just celebrating, like freshmen, and they were just, you know, it was 2 a.m. I don't know, it was su super late, and we were all just, there was a huge party coming back, and we were just, you know, you felt like a, I don't know, an NFL player. Like, it was awesome. So um, it was pretty incredible. For you and the team as a whole, when you have this continued success, how did you keep that drive? I guess for mm -hmm. you personally, because you're setting all these records and you're doing it in multiple sports, but really, what was it that, what, what kept you going? After you, you know, you, you make two Final Four appearances, then you win the mm -hmm. national championship. Okay, yeah. nope, you come back and do it again. Yeah. Like, how? 
Yeah, well, you have to. Um, <laughs> if you already did it, you have to do it again. So um, I, I think that that's kind of our, was our mentality that, you know, you're going to be disappointed if you didn't execute it again, but it, it gets even harder. And so we had an amazing team and we all were on the same page and just the, the kind of community and family that we had as a team, we all had the same goals and you can't ask for anything more than that. And I think that continued. In fact, I know it continued yep. just within the field hockey program. Yep. What does it mean to you and, and your teammates that are here? Yep. Uh, just to have been such a pillar and, and kind of set the level and set the bar so high and then to see future teams yeah. carry the torch and have success and bring home even more national championships. I mean, that, that's incredible, and I think it's a testament to Nikki and the program in general and just the consistency of the college and caring about the sport. Um, and I think it's just it's amazing that we did it first, but it's also amazing that it had continued to happen. And so that, I think that that's just, a, you know, just an amazing part of the program. All right, I have one more question. Why did you play field hockey? <laughs> um, what, what led you to, ah, all of a sudden? I, I don't think I was good enough at soccer, so I had to go over to field hockey. I don't know. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. you did. Yeah, exactly. So, congratulations. Thank you very incredible much. Stuff. Thank, I you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. I'm John Cross of the class of 1976, Secretary of Development and College Relations here at Bowdoin, and played on two ECAC um, championship hockey teams back in a very long time ago. Uh, tonight is my privilege to induct Raymond LaBelle into the Bowdoin Athletic Hall of Honor. Raymond L. LaBelle of the class of 1949 was a main golf legend as a precocious champion at Lewiston High School, a leader and collegiate champion at Bowdoin, and a national record-setting champion throughout his adult life. At age 17, while still in high school, Ray was the youngest competitor ever to win the main amateur golf championship. His love of the sport and his extraordinary accomplishments in it continued in the decades that followed. In his senior year at Lewiston High School, in addition to capturing the main amateur title, Ray won both the main junior championship and the main interscholastic championship, the only player ever to achieve that triple feat. After high school, Ray postponed his college career to serve in the Air Corps of the U.S. Navy during World War II, where he received five Air Medals and two Navy Distinguished Crosses. At Bowdoin, Ray served as captain and player coach of the golf team, leading the team to both the Maine and New England Collegiate Team Championships. Ray continued his remarkable individual success as well, winning the state intercollegiate championship and again being crowned Maine amateur champion, the third of his six state amateur titles. After graduating from Bowdoin and from Tufts School of Dentistry, Ray established a, a successful oral surgery practice in Maine while continuing to rewrite the amateur golf record books. Ray won a national record 47 club championships and captured the Portland Country Club Championship title so many times, 32, that the club's championship prize now bears his name, the Ray LaBelle Trophy. In addition to his six main amateur championship wins, Ray, Ray was the main senior amateur champion 13 times. In addition to his unparalleled playing accomplishments, Ray volunteered as a member of the United States Golf Association Committee for 12 years as a rules official in Maine and throughout New England, and as president of the New England Golf Association. For his contributions to the sport, Ray was inducted into the Maine Sports Hall of Fame in 1981 and into the Maine Golf Hall of Fame in 1993 as a member of its inaugural class. Today, we remember Ray's extraordinary accomplishments and contributions to the sport of golf today and are proud to celebrate his induction into the Bowdoin College Athletic Hall of Honor. Here to accept the award on behalf of the family is Ray's son, Michael LaBelle.
got a book too. Really? I have a book too, and, really? I, and I, I'll just really? I'll preface my comments by saying, uh, Lindsay, my sister's right behind you, and she went to Middlebury. Oh, jeez. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first thing I just have to ask: thirty-two championships at the Portland Country Club. Was there any time where people came up to you and said, "When is he, when is he going to retire? Like, Can't you get him to go away?" Yeah, did that Can't happen? You? Uh, it never happened. He would never have gone away. Um, that was uh, a place that he loved. I was actually there last night, uh, and you could feel his spirit in the room. But it, uh, you know, I caddied for him in a number of those uh, tournaments, and he was a, a different guy uh, when he'd get into those matches. Um, he would play around, and it would be match play, and, and, and he'd be going down the, you know, the fairway, and it might be all even after nine, and he was very jovial, talking with his opponent and having a good time, and they'd make the turn, and he'd shake his opponent's hand and say, it's been very nice getting to know you. I have to go to work now. <laughs> and it would be game over. So he was just a dominant uh, player. And um, I also wanted to mention here this evening that he would be so proud and so happy to be in the same uh, class coming into the induction with Dr. Buck. Dr. Buck was one of my dad's best friends, and whenever Bucky would enter the room, my father would light up. They were 10 years uh, apart in age, but Dr. Leonardo Buck and my father were very, very close. So I just met Jonathan, uh, the grandson here this evening, but his now new name is Bucky. <laughs> uh, Bucky. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> So we heard all, all the accomplishments, and, and you just short, shared a couple of stories, but what was your father like as a man? You know, maybe off the golf course. Um, you know, he was born in 1923, so he was born and raised in the Great Depression. He was a member of uh, the greatest generation. And if you Google up words that describe members of the greatest generation, they describe my father to a T. Uh, unbelievably um, humble, he was uh, focused, he was disciplined, he was charitable, he was quiet but confident, and one of the words that was on the list, which is actually an anomaly in his case, was frugality. <laughs> so if anyone knew my dad, if he found something he liked, he would buy three of them. <laughs> so. This drove my mother crazy, but uh, that was the one word that didn't fit with, with my dad. He was very, very, very generous, but a, a tremendous spirit. Now, part of that generation, obviously, was the war. And, and your father was a Navy pilot in World War II, um, right around the time of Bowdoin, right before. Mm -hmm. Did he ever talk about that and, and maybe how it shaped him, or did you, you know, did you get a sense, would it come out in certain places, just kind of how it shaped him? He would very rarely talk about his war experience. Uh, he came out of high school, came home uh, one day to enlist in the Navy, and he told his mother, I'm going to be a fighter pilot. And she said, a fighter pilot? You, you've never even talked of airplanes. And he said, well, the reason I'm going to be a fighter pilot is I'm either going to come home or I'm not. I don't want to come home disabled. I want to play golf. I want my hands. I'm going to be an oral surgeon. And I, uh, I'm either coming home or I'm not. And so off he went uh, to Texas to train to be a fighter pilot. And by the way, won the US Navy golf tournament. Naturally. <laughs> while he was down there. So <laughs> Of course he did. Yeah, Why would he yeah. But never, uh, never spoke of it, um, you know, sitting down and talking about it. Just didn't, uh, didn't feel that that was something he wanted to convey. What did he have to say just about his time at Bowdoin? And, he and loved Bowdoin. In fact, this chair that I'm sitting in, I, I settled my dad's estate. He passed away 12 years ago. I wonder where the chair went. There are seven siblings. He raised seven children. Somebody's got the Bowdoin chair, and I'm going to find out where that <laughs> is. <laughs> he loved Bowdoin. One of the things he used to talk about was, of course, these um, men and women came back from the war. This was the era of the big band, and my dad was a, uh, a tremendous musician. He was a surgeon. He was a fighter pilot. He was an athlete. He was a woodworker. He it was just an incredible guy. Um, but the, uh, 
the things that he really loved were, you know, the music that when these folks came back from the war, there was the big band era. So this probably doesn't occur here today, but they talked about raucous, you know, fraternity parties that were going on, and they would have the bands playing, and he loved it. My mother hated it because she wouldn't see him all night. He'd just be up on the stage playing. You're saying live bands? Live bands. Oh, yeah, wow. big band era live bands. They'd, they'd, all, the, all the musicians would get together and play, and so he loved it. He was a cornet player, trumpet player. Was there a live band when you guys came back from the national championship, or did it just... <laughs> okay. We'll right. talk. We'll talk. <laughs> We should start that out. Uh, how, would you, how would you describe you know, his legacy and what he brought to your family, but also, again, just, just the people that were around him and, yeah, and were with he, him? He was incredibly humble. He, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, as I started my business career, he would tell me, Michael, when you go to meet with people, remember, if you're on time, you're early. If, if you're, no, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you forgot. And never forget that the people you're going to meet with, their time is way more valuable than your time. So never, for, never forget that. And uh, he would carry that sort of process through his life. He, he would never um, want to, you know, pontificate on all of his wins and all of these things. He would much, much rather get together with Bucky and talk about rules. <laughs> and so his legacy through his seven children, are, uh, you know, he would um, bring us into this wood shop that he had, uh, which would rival any high school woodworking shop. And he would try to create an environment where you would want to participate with him. And it was difficult because he'd come home from work go right down to the shop, turn every machine on. It was dust and dirt and loud. And, and uh, I remember this one time he tried to pull me in and pull me in. And I'd go upstairs and watch TV. We had a black and white TV. This is, you know, back in the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, on the third day of this, he came up and he said, listen, I've been downstairs for three nights in the shop trying to get you to come down and learn some of this stuff I'm, I'm doing. Um, but you can sit here in front of the TV if you want, but I'm going outside to build the tree fort that I've been thinking about. And I was out of my chair and down the road with my dad. And so, um, you know, his legacy was that he would try to draw you in. He would never try to force anything on you, but he would create an environment that you would just die to get in with him. Did you get any of his golf game? Very little of his golf game. My sister Vicky's here. She's actually a three-time PCC championship uh, winner. How Six. many? Six. Six times. Six. Yeah. Mm. Got to brush up on that. Be a long ride home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's probably got the chair. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for, for sharing. Good evening. I'm Courtney Ruggles, Women's Basketball Class of 2004, a member of the Hall of Honor Selection Committee. I'm filled with immense pride as I represent the Selection Committee and the group of women's basketball alumni here tonight to induct our former coach, Stephanie Pemper, into the Bowdoin Athletic Hall of Honor. Stephanie L. Pemper, you led the team to unprecedented success and lifted the women's basketball program to an elite level, regularly capturing conference titles, competing for national championships, and setting the polar bears on a path of sustained excellence. Notable highlights include a remarkable overall winning percentage of 83%, topped only by a 90% winning percentage in NESCAC games, which included capturing the first seven straight NESCAC championships in the history of the league, a 76-game home winning streak from 2001 to 2007, and unprecedented success in the NCAA tournament, qualifying for the tournament in nine out of your 10 seasons, including reaching the Elite Eight in six consecutive seasons and representing Bowdoin in its first ever national championship game. But despite all that extraordinary success, I believe we are here tonight because your time at Bowdoin was never focused on accolades. Rather, it was reflected on one of the most central tenets to Bowdoin, to be for the common good. You structured our practices in the program to be about doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, to contribute to something larger than ourselves. We worked hard for one another and competed with pride through the understanding that we were representing our communities, the Bowdoin community, the Brunswick community, 
the community of female athletes, and on and on with everything we did on and off the court. You taught us to commit to the common good, and in doing so, you built a program that welcomed others into that sphere. Reflecting on the celebrations here tonight, and this is the 50th anniversary of Title IX, it's undeniably fitting that so many of our successful women's programs are represented through this evening's honorees. Steph, your vision, leadership, and dedication led the way in a profound era of growth and change in women's athletics at Bowdoin. When success of your magnitude is earned during one's time at a school, it is clear that the impact of a coach can be felt much longer than our four years, much longer than your 10 years. The lasting impact of your time here cannot be understated. So, on behalf of the women's basketball alumni community, the larger athletics community, the Bowdoin community, I would like to say thank you for all you've done for us, for all you've given us, and for all the ways you have connected and inspired us. We are pleased to honor you tonight with your well-deserved induction into the Bowdoin Athletic Hall of Honor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there might be some this water. Yeah, no, it's honestly it's been good to me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there's a fresh one. Oh, nice. You want to here? Take the All fresh right, one. There you That's go. better. That's better. Thank you. I mean, wow. Right off the bat, holy basketball team here. I mean, the entire upper half, past players, current players, coaching staff. What does it mean? To, to see, you know, your former players and just, just this, this group of, of individuals that has just, you know, yeah. become what it is, I guess. Yeah. And you all know what I mean. Yeah. In the best of ways. Yeah. You're good at what you do, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, seriously. No, I mean, this is like why you coach, honestly. I mean, I think Liz and John and I don't know if Nikki's here. Um, would all say this is why you coach um, for the relationships that they develop with each other um, that you know last them their lifetime um, and getting to know you know their kids getting to know each other and just their parents getting to know each other and yeah this is this represents exactly why you coach so we, we got a lot to get to but first you're, you're from California you played in Idaho how did you get to Brunswick I know. How, how does that happen I know I know I, um, I know, I was an assistant coach at Harvard, which was crazy to kind of get that job, and um, we just had a terrific three years, and um, my boss there was just someone who really inspired me, and it was just such a kind of an idyllic program, um, and really that college kind of inspired me, you know, she was very much about um, just empowering women, and um, and sort of demanding um, equality. And um, so she really kind of got me thinking, um, is coaching what I meant to do with my life? You know, I was just a super happy assistant coach there. I was a proctor in a freshman dorm, which is how I got to kind of know the college a little bit better and really respect it and be inspired by it. Um, and I, someone, the Bowdoin job came open and someone said, if you like Harvard and that kind of community, like you, you would like Bowdoin, like you would like the kids who go there, and um, because it really was so far from how I grew up. I mean, I grew up just in a public school out in Southern California, and you know, like you said, went to Idaho. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just, uh, so Jeff Ward um, called, and um, I, uh, it, it took me kind of forever to make the decision, but he said something that I used uh, later in my life um, to try to, get women to come to our program, which he said, um, you know, don't take the job if you're not inspired to be here. And um, I, had, I had never heard of Bowdoin um, when the job came up. Um, in college, I had a friend who had a connection to the Hurricane Island Outward Bound School in Rockland, and I had done like a 30-day backpacking course there in college, and then came back the summer before my senior in college. So I knew that Maine was beautiful, and I loved Maine. and. Um, so yeah, I just was like, why not see if I'm meant to do this? And, uh, and Jeff kind of pissed me off a little bit with that. <laughs> so w when you did get here, pretty much instant success right at the end of the 90s, and then obviously the NESCAC comes around. Mm -hmm. And for seven straight years, the rest of the NESCAC had to watch Bowdoin rise to the top. Mm -hmm. And I, how do you think that 
maybe established the conference and maybe pushed other schools to, geez, we can't let Bowdoin, mm. you know, get to, get to eight, nine, ten. Do you feel like you set the standard when the conference was just taking off? Mm -hmm. And how did things kind of change when that did happen? Yeah, no, we didn't. I don't know about <laughs> setting the standard. I mean, Williams was winning a ton. Middlebury is winning a ton. Um, you know, obviously, yes, we had success. But, um, you know, I didn't. I, the three years that I was at Harvard, we went to the NCAA tournament. And I really kind of became enamored with the NCAA tournament. And at the time, NESCAC schools weren't allowed to participate in the tournament. And Jeff sort of promised me in the interview process that, you know, eventually we wouldn't be competing for ECAC championships, but for NCAA championships. And so um, he was right on that. And, um, you know, it, I, he had that vision of kind of what NESCAC could become, you know, his experience at Dartmouth and at Columbia and at Brown. Um, and, you know, at the time, the UAA was the best conference in the country in Division III. Um, so Emory and Chicago and Rochester and NYU. And, um, but NESCAC schools were better academic schools than those schools. Um, and so I think Jeff really had that vision for if we could just figure out, you know, admissions and facilities and staffing um, and recruiting, you know, that we could, NESCAC could become kind of a premier conference. And, it seems like it's really happened. I mean, it, it didn't happen while I was at Bowdoin. I think it's really happened in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Well, I think you, you know, laid the framework for that, of course, with, you know, the numbers and the championships. But again, you talk about the culture of the team. Mm -hmm. and, and what is it like for you to see that culture kind of continue from when you were here in the 2000s and kind of, again, see this family that, yeah. you know, going back to the Harvard coach, talking about inspiring people. You know, what is it like to see that? Yeah, oh my goodness. Um, you know, f um, for me, um, it's, it's, it's about respect and unconditional love, really, is, is kind of, for me, what it's about, and, and, um, and commitment and talent. And, but when I first got here, I asked all the women on the team that very first year, 90, the fall of 98, why do you want to be on this team? And only one of them said, essentially, because I love basketball. Um, everyone kind of said, because I want to be a part of a team. And the one who said, I, want, I love basketball is Jesse Mayall, who's here um, now. And, um, and I, of course, connected with that kid, right? Um, and, uh, but I loved them all, of course, and so that was the goal, was trying to, but uh, it just so happened that she was our point guard. Um, and, you know, again, was a freshman. And so, you know, my first four years at Bowdoin, I, there was two constants in my life. It was Jesse and it was Jeff Ward. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, and then, you know, we slowly, you know, I can't say enough in like that first year. You know, today it's harder for teams, I think, to sustain culture. Back in 98, when I got here, you know, if you kind of got things going in the right direction, it, it like really kind of kept going. And, and so uh, Stacey Barron was our captain that first year. And thank goodness, like she was so beloved by her teammates and she bought in and, and you know, Jesse was so key. And, um, and we, had, we had two all-conference level players that first year, Sam Good, Lauren Myers. And, and then our second year, you know, and really that year, so Christy Royer came next, who was an All-American, and, and really the class of 2004 was inspired by that first year because they were all juniors in high school. So it just kind of, the culture really, you know, the class of 04 was so great, and, and, and it just, everything just kind of, in terms of culture, like, yeah. really got built. I did want to talk about that 2004 season. Um, maybe not the last game. Yeah. But, um, we can what talk about it? the last game. We can talk about the last game. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. What, what was that like? You talk about the build up to it, but yeah. could you describe that team and did you sense something different? Was it con a, how much of it right. was a continuation? Yeah. And also, how did you, what was your message to the team after that final game? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, yeah, it was that season just so much had snowballed, you know. So those women, the class of 2004, when they were freshmen, we won the first NESCAC championship and then. It was, you know, repeating, and then it was getting to the Sweet 16, and then it was, um, you know, a New York Times article, right? And then it was just, uh, um, you know, 
um, getting, to, getting to host you know, the sectionals for the first time their senior year. And just the community support, um, you know, the everything, it just everything kind of snowballed, you know, and I think um, kind of led us to that, to that, that first Final Four. Um, but in that team, you know, you had, we had this great senior class that was so, so special. Um, Beth is here and Courtney and Laura um, and Christina. And um, they just were, they just had everything, you know, and they, they had great camaraderie. They really accepted their roles and they found a way to connect with me, you know. And, um, but then we had terrific talent and leadership, you know, in that sophomore, junior class and Allison and Justine and Vanessa Russell. Um, and then that year was the only year that our two, you know, sort of real player of the year, national player of the year, Laura and Eileen Flaherty overlapped. Eileen was a freshman, so I think that explains that year. <laughs> now, I know there have been some questions, some, some conversations. Uh, we, had, we had a better year. She liked this team better. <laughs> Which team, you know? You've been talking to Justine. The, the, the <laughs> I got a letter that said, you gotta make sure you ask this question. This is your chance to set the record straight for everybody <laughs> in the women's basketball no. lore. No way. <laughs> well, I mean, like, Lindsay would never do that. There's no way I'll put her on the spot, right? I mean, shoot. So that's a, that's a plead the fifth. Yeah. What was your favorite, or what was your biggest takeaway as we close things out here? What was your biggest takeaway just at your time at Bowdoin? Um, that you still think about or remember here today? Yeah. You know, honestly, um, I, I, I love to, to think about um, what has happened since I left, you know? And, you know, it's, it's, it's been so emotional um, and heartwarming, really, to watch kind of how the program evolved and, um, you know, under Adrian Scheibel's and, um, and now, you know, Megan's taking the reins. Um, you know, for me, so just being a fan, you know, and just seeing, like, so my first year away, Maria's, uh, t uh, were, were seniors, and I mean, I flew up here to watch their NESCAC championship game, and, and they won, you know, they hosted, and they won, and it was incredible, and I flew out to Minnesota um, to watch when they went to the Final Four, and, but just, you know, you've, you've had women in this program, um, you know, uh, the Jill Henriksons, like the Maddie Hassans, the Lydia Caputis that I first met when they were elementary school um, kids. And, um, and then just this incredible talent of like the Kate Kerrigans and the Abby Kellys. And um, so I just like, just, you know, I was so fortunate to be exposed to people like Kathy Delaney Smith at Harvard and Jeff Ward um, that really you know, they care, they're conscientious, they see the good in people, they believe in people. Um, and we played Adrian Scheibels when she was the head coach at Swarthmore in oh, wow. 2001 and 2002, and they, they beat us the first time, I think. And um, so I was so thrilled, you know, when she uh, was interested in the job. And, and, um, and so it's, you know, to me that, like, just, it's just, it's, it's so special anytime a women's program can have kind of sustained excellence and do things in just really the best ways. Um, so I actually would kind of like to talk about, I talk about that, so I'm not gonna answer your question. Yeah, no, if you, want, if you want to talk more about <laughs> no, that. No, no, that's it. No, I just wanted to sort of say that because, yeah. yeah, because it's just been really fun. And again, that is kind of like why we do what we do. You know, when Adrian got the job, I was, I still remember being on the phone with her in my office at Navy and just breaking down crying, and it was so funny. She and I are a little different, and she's like, are you crying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, you don't know me, <laughs> yes, you know. But I just was like, it just means so much, and you know, I felt like they were really in good hands. And, um, and now it's been really fun you know, just to watch Allison being back in the league at Bates, and obviously it's such a special year this year. And um, I wish I could follow, like, we have so many women coaching, um, not just from when I was here, but from when Adrian. I mean, four NESCAT coaches right now, you know, have ties to, to the, to the Bowdoin program. Um, I wish I could watch everyone and support them more than I do, but I just so happen to be so close um, this year um, to watch Allison's teams. And um, so 
I don't know, field hockey, soccer, lacrosse, if you all are getting into coaching and just spreading the right message of really empowering women. Um, and, uh, but it's, yeah, it's really special and I'm just so blessed in my life. You think about it, I mean, incredible. We're just here a short time and, and it's, I've just been really blessed from my little, my little 22 years as a, as a head coach. Well, congratulations and thank you for you know, laying the framework for, yeah. for such sustained success. Thank you. So. Well, what an evening. I think a lot about the importance of developmental relationships. <clears throat> when I left Bowdoin, academia and education found me, and so that's something I think about a lot. And as I sit here and listen, I hear the question, don't take the job unless the place, or the statement, don't take the job unless the place inspires you. And Steph says, it's, it's why you do coaching. And so to all of us here, particularly the honorees and those of you who are connected to Bowdoin as current, past athletes or committed to something in your life, you can train, you can prepare, you can compete. But unless those things happen in the context of a developmental relationship where there's care, there's understanding, we hear our honorees talk tonight about that being the fabric and the thing that really matters years later, and in some cases, generations later. And so when I came to Bowdoin as a senior from Kansas City, Kansas to visit this place when I arrived, someone said, go stand in the middle of the quad and see how it feels. And so we hope that while you're here, whether you're an alum or visiting to support someone, we hope that before you leave, you have the chance to spend some time on this campus so that you can feel the magic that has fostered all of these relationships that have led to so much good success on the at behalf of Bowdoin Athletics. At this time, I wanna ask for one more round of applause for our inductees and their families. We also would like to thank our moderator this evening, Mr. David Peck. <laughs> David is moving away from us to advance his professional career in his home state of Connecticut this month. Best luck to you, David, and we hope that you still make time to visit campus frequently. Inductees, I invite you to join me on the stage at the conclusion of the program to accept your citations and gifts family, special guests, and others who wish to have a photo with inductees, please stick around. Congratulations to all of you. And at the beginning, I gave us permission to whisper because of the setting, but we got to end it big. Are you with me? Here we go. Go you bears!